Good afternoon, everyone. Um, machine learning, property loans for fun and profit. This is a uh, very applied talk, really, about how we can use the MLJ framework um, on a data set and how we'll actually end up hopefully making some money out of it. So quickly, just about me. Uh, I'm a quant at a big bank during the day, and I've been using Julia since about uh, 2015, so version 0.3.6. Uh, and in my old job, I was using Julia uh, professionally as well. We had a lot of uh, analytics written in Julia, so I've got a decent amount of experience in using it. Um, so I'm going to give you some of that experience hopefully today uh, with a talk on Julia, machine learning and finance, uh, a little bit of everything. So the financial part, um, we're looking at a data set of property loans and uh, trying to explore really how uh, when a company wants some money, uh, what happens when we give it to them and do they pay us back or not. There's this company called estateguru.co and they give you the opportunity to invest in different loans um, based on different properties around the European area and then you're hopefully going to earn a return. So the interest rate here is uh, one of the columns. That's what you'll get back after you give them some money if they pay the money back. So the interest rate that you're going to get is related to the amount of risk you're taking. A high interest rate means that you're taking on a lot of risk. So there's a high chance that you might not get that money back. And this is when that loan defaults. That's the technical term. Uh, you don't get your money back, so the loan's defaulted. So what we want to try and do is use the data Estate Guru provide to try and predict what loans are actually going to default using all the information. And actually, is the data got any more additional information in it and how we can use machine learning to help us? Uh, Estate Guru are nice enough to provide us a CSV of all their loans historically um, and lots of different information behind those loans and uh, what describes them. This is a few rows of the example of that data and we can see that we've got say the country, the interest rate, the actual type of loan and lots of other variables that tell us uh, what actually is happening underneath. So you can sign up to Estate Guru today and download, th download that data yourself. We're going to use MLJ, so it's been mentioned a few times already in this talk, um, and it's your one-stop shop for machine learning. It gives you all the tools that you need just in one package, um, and you can do your entire machine learning workflow um, using MLJ functions, and it gives you a really nice interface to do all the tasks. So things such as pre-processing the data, so when we've got categorical data and numerical data that we need to transform into something a bit more machine-readable by scaling it or encoding it, all done in MLJ. Um, actually fitting the models and all the different type of models, be it a linear regression, some tree models, or k nearest neighbors that I'll go through in a bit. But there's one interface. You don't have to worry about how someone's implemented that machine learning um, model. You can just load up the MLJ package, and it's all there for you. This goes for tuning the hyperparameters as well. Um, it's a simple interface. You just say what different ranges you want and let the models work out how, uh, what the actual hyperparameters need to be. And then also, finally, evaluating the model. All of that really can be described in some simple Julia code. So to start with, we're using MLJ. So we're going to import that package. And then we're deciding what the actual uh, function or the machine model we're going to use for, for, to start with. Uh, to begin with, we'll use logistic regression. So we're going to load the logistic classifier from the MLJ linear models package. And that brings it into our environment, uh, the ability to do logistic regression. On the next line, we're going to create the machine of the logistic classifier with a lambda equals zero. This is one of those hyperparameters that we set to zero. Um, we're not going to do any tuning at the minute. It's just a simple logistic regression. And we're going to pass in our data, which is the x data, just the interest rate, and then our y outcomes, which is whether the loan defaulted or not. And this gives us our machine that we're going to make learn. We make it learn by calling the fit function and telling it to just use the training rows no uh, outputs, and then this is able to then just learn the correct weights of all those different uh, inputs. And then we evaluate the machine, yet again, using the training data and the various metrics that we pass in. And we do some cross-validation, uh, shuffling and resampling to evaluate how good that model is. So this is the general concept of MLJ. We're going to be loading in packages, training them, and then evaluating them. And all that really changes is the type of model we're um, pulling in. And hopefully someone has written uh, a package that is covering all the different and new machine learning models. What metrics are we going to use today for trying to evaluate whether our models are good at predicting this defaults of the loans? 
Well, we've got the log loss and the Brier loss for our loss functions. We want to make these as low as possible. And then we've got our accuracy functions, so how often is the model correct? Uh, the kappa metric, which is how often is the model better than just a null model? And then the AUC, which is checking whether we're ranking defaulting loans higher than other ones. And for these metrics, we want higher values. So on the left-hand side, lower values. On the right-hand side, higher is better. What does our data actually look like? So like I said, we've got lots of different variables coming in from Estate Guru. Uh, one of those being the interest rate that we can see on average is around 10%, ranging from the maximum of 14 to a lower of eight. So this is the actual interest rate we're gonna get on the um, uh, property if we invest in it, and we're gonna be expecting the higher ones to default more often, but we'll be able to see if that's true from the model outputs. We've got the loan to value, so how much money they're actually asking for relative to that property. Again, distributed quite uh, neatly around 60%. And then we've got the actual property value and the funded amount that they're asking for. These are on the log scale here, but again, nicely distributed. So hopefully these will give us some information on default rates. We've then got the qualitative variables, so more uh, descriptive variables of the different uh, loans. Uh, the actual property type, most of them are residential, and we've got the odd summer cottage cropping up there as well. And also the countries, we can see that they're mainly European countries and some other descriptions as well. So first, we're going to have to actually convert our raw data into something that MLJ will expect by telling it what the data classes are or the data types are in this case. So for the uh, qualitative ones, we're going to tell them that they're multiple or multi-class because they're factor variables. And then this allows us to then do the one-hot encoding slightly later. Before that, we're going to unpack the data and separate it into the Y and X variables. And then we're going to split into a train and test set by doing a 70-30% split and doing some shuffling as well so it's all mixed up. Now, even pre-processing the data, these are still machines using the MLJ framework, so everything is a machine in MLJ. We create the continuous encoder, we create the machine from it and fit the machine on our data, and then we transform our X variables to give us our X encoded data. So now we've gone from uh, columns that are factor variables to now additional columns from the one-hot encoding. If for the uh, numerical values, we're gonna do the shift and scaling, so minus in the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. Again, loading in the standardizer machine, fitting it on our uh, data, this time passing in the features that we're interested in shifting and scaling. And this gives us our finally our X trans. So the uh, all the data are now encoded and transformed and ready to model using MLJ. So the very first model that we're gonna fit, this is gonna be the null model. And this is what we expect all of our other models to try and beat. Um, it's a constant model, so we're just gonna predict a constant default rate. And this is coming up from the overall average default rate of the loans in the data set which when we look at the accuracy is about 91.8%. So on average, these loans default uh, about say, just under 10%. All our other models we hope should beat this, otherwise what are we actually doing? Um, and so yeah, make sure this is, uh, everything is better than this. Now I said at the start that taking on a higher amount of interest means that you're probably more likely to not get your money back. So we can test that by fitting a single variable linear model just by passing in interest rate from the transform data set, fitting that model and then seeing what those metrics look like. No real changes, the log loss goes slightly lower, um, but the accuracies and the cappers and all the other ones don't really change too much. But what is interesting to see is that the interest rate as that increases, the default rate of those loans does increase. So what we said at the start, higher interest rate leads to a higher default does appear to be uh, at least true in practice. Okay, we've got all our variables. Let's throw them into the logistic regression and see how well we do um, as a prediction. So again, creating our logistic machine, passing in all the data now, training it on the training set and evaluating it in the exact same way. We get a 2% increase in accuracy. Happy days, it's doing slightly better. Uh, the machine learning is actually doing something here. The loss scales have gone down slightly and the AUC has gone up as well. So this basic linear regression is helping us predict what loans are doing and whether they're going to default or not. So there is some information in all the variables that we've chucked in. Do we actually need all those variables though? We can start penalizing the regression, so trying to let the machines work out whether uh, a certain coefficient does have an effect on the default or not. And this is where we're going to start tuning the hyperparameters using MLJ. 
This time we're creating a tuned model and passing it in the ranges of the two different uh, variables that we've got, gamma and lambda in this elastic net regression. And then we iterate through 25 different combinations of those parameters and find out what variables give us the best model. So we've got a final tuned elastic net regression model that we evaluate again using those same metrics. Doesn't really do too much to the accuracy or the other metrics. And this is because the data isn't really that big and there isn't really that many variables being included. There's only about 2,000 loans in this data set and all the previous variables I've shown hasn't made it too much of a bigger problem. But you can imagine as time goes on and there's more loans and we start including more variables, this is where this might become more important. Right, let's move on to some non-parametric models, the uh, big fancy word that hopefully improves our accuracy. K nearest neighbors is where we're trying to separate all the different loans into their own clusters and trying to work out which loans are similar to other ones and then look at the uh, overall uh, default rate of those ones, of those loans together. The default value of K is five, so each of the loan will try and find five other similar loans and then we'll look at those, uh, it's those default rates there. And we can see that the accuracy does slightly better than the null model, but similar to the linear regressions, no real uh, improvements. And the log loss actually gets a lot worse where this is a slightly different approach to the model. But why five? Five is just a default value. We should probably tune this model and see what the optimal number of nearest neighbors are. And this is what we do again using the tuning uh, phrase or tuning state of the models. We're going to go from K from five all the way up to 100 and then see what the AUC looks like and then use that to dictate what we should actually use. This is the AUC on the graph and then the best one is about K equals 14 for some reason. So there's a bit of a uh, interpretability problem. Why should we trust this K equals 14? Who really knows? But it's more of a demonstration of how we tune these types of models. The accuracy, again, slightly better than the null model, but no real uh, major changes. Random forest models and XG boost models. Uh, again, these are fitted in the exact same way. You don't need to see more code of me loading in the packages and things like that. We can go through, tune their hyperparameters and come up uh, with their results in the exact same framework using MLJ because someone's done the hard work of writing the interfaces uh, beforehand and I can just benefit from using the simple functions. But most importantly, this is where we start getting some good accuracies. 95%, much better than the null model, much better than what we've seen before. And also the log losses and the Brier losses much lower as well. So it looks like what the random forest models and the XG boost models are doing here is good and this is how we should proceed. We've got lots of different independent models now. We've got linear regression, we've got the K and N, we've got the forest models. We can combine them all into something that we call a stacked model. Um, and you'll find if you've ever been on Kaggle or done some of their competitions, this does uh, work quite well for lots of different problems. And MLJ make it very easy for you to do that as well. So you just use the stack function, tell it what the meta learner is. So in this case, logistic regression, because we're predicting the default rates, how we're gonna resample and all the different models that get inputted into this big model. Um, and then again, create the machine, fit it, evaluate it. So exactly the same process, you just need the previous models. And this is an easy way to combine all that different uh, information that we get from the other models. So all the previous evaluation has been on the training set. So it's always seen the data, it's probably not great. We should really be evaluating these models on our test set, 30% of the data that the models have never seen before. And we can see that our stack model is the best at a 61% kappa, better than the average and a decent AUC as well. And the XG boost and the random forest models do very well as well. So everything that we saw in the train set previously seems to be true on the test set as well. So all that we've done, hopefully I've convinced you that we can model the default rate using the data and get a decent model coming out of it. So now we can think about what the outputs look like. So in this case on the X axis, this is our predicted default rate. And on the Y axis is the actual default rate and we seem to be increasing our predictions with the uh, actual default rates true. So we can say that these models appear to be well calibrated. So we can go forward and hopefully use the model output to try and predict what loans will default, let that guide our investment decisions and hopefully make some money. So making bets. I've done the Julia bit, I've done the data bit, now onto the finance bit. Using our model, we're gonna now invest in any of our loans if the model thinks there's less than a 50% chance of defaulting. A very basic strategy, but we're essentially saying we've got some information, let's use that to guide our investment process. And this gives us four different outcomes. Uh, to start at the top, the missed opportunities. This is where we haven't invested because the model has predicted that it's going to default. 
but it hasn't defaulted after all. And that has happened seven times, and this has cost us a profit of 0.675, because when each we make the decision, we invest one unit, and then afterwards we get uh, one bit back. Yeah, go on, question? Everything. You lose everything. If it's successful, you're only earning the interest rate. Yes. Well, that's where, where um, so the question was, if it defaults, we lose all our money, but if it pays anything back, we'll get our money back plus some interest rates. Um, but a very basic strategy is what we're doing here is we're just going to invest based off the model output rather than the, uh, what the interest rate is. We're not really concerned. It's a very dumb uh, approach, but we're just trying to see if the model knows. Yeah, but like for the model prediction, for if you're gonna make money, uh, potentially, potentially. I think we'll, uh, we'll, we could probably talk about it after right, if I've missed something uh, fundamental there. Hopefully not. Um, but the, yeah, so the missed opportunities in this case, uh, we would have, we've lost out an opportunity of uh, 0 0.765. The bad loans that we've correctly avoided, um, where we haven't invested because that probability of default is less than 50 and it has actually defaulted. There was 30 of them, so we've managed to avoid 30 problems. Uh, and this has meant we haven't lost 30 units. And then into when we've actually made money, our money making loans where we have invested and it hasn't defaulted has given us a profit of 66.48. So roughly 10% of the number of ones we've invested in because the average interest rate is around 10%. And then the ones that have actually lost money, our model thought they wouldn't default but they have defaulted and that's cost us 35 units. But at the end of the day, 66 minus 35, we're up, this strategy seems to have uh, made some money. But the actual uh, strategy of investing everything based on the um, output probably isn't optimal. We're throwing away a lot of information in this case um, and we need to resize our bets based off what we think the model is. So the model is giving us an outputted probability and this is where we're going to use the Kelly betting formula to size what, how much we're actually going to invest. Now, a very famous theorem that is used in lots of different places. We have some fraction of our capital, of our total capital that we're going to bet based off the probability of winning and the payoff that that uh, loan is going to come in. So if we do some maths and rearrange our data, we come out with our model output, which is the probability of default, and the interest rate to give us our optimal bet size for each of those individual loans. So if we go through again and we look at the ones where we made money, this hasn't actually changed um, whether we're going to invest in something or not because uh, we're still going to make our investment decision based on that 50% rule. It's just going to change how much we are betting on each of the loans. And the money makers, they've reduced their profit from 66 to about 59. So slight reduction in profit there. But more importantly, the losers have gone from costing us 35 units to now only costing us 20 units. Now, this is because where we've not been certain in our prediction, we've had a uh, lower probability of default versus the actual interest rate that we're going to get. This is where um, we've adjusted our bet size down. And so it's not cost us as much by betting just one unit each and every time. And the actual final profit gives us 39 and 11 units compared to the 31 units uh, previously. So Kelly betting here has improved the actual outcomes of our overall uh, performance. So happy days. So in summary, um, there's some fun data out there if you know where to look. So I stumbled across the state guru, um, saw that they gave their data available and thought it would be an interesting problem. Uh, I wrote the blog post and ended up doing this talk on it. So yeah, there's uh, fun things to do with the data in Julia. MLJ is a great little package that does everything you want in just one interface. So I would really recommend anyone uh, to get really involved in it and just yeah, explore all the different machine learning there. Um, and I should, probably should highlight, understand the risks in these types of problems as well. Estate Guru is just a simple company operating out of Europe. It could go bankrupt one day. It's not the uh, only risk happening. And uh, you can't machine learn away those types of risks at the end of the day. Uh, if you want to read the blog post, that's the link uh, where I've written more in depth, a bit more code as well. Um, and it's probably interesting to note really on the notes of the risks. Uh, generally, the default rate was fairly stable. I published the uh, blog post in July last year, and then as the macroeconomic conditions have changed, 
uh, the default rate's gone up quite a bit. So I wonder if my model would have carried on doing as well or would have things gone uh, very wrong very quickly afterwards. So just goes to show uh, you can't always predict what's going to happen just from the data in front of you. Thank you. Any questions? Did you actually try it? Like, no. did you actually put the money down? <laughs> no, it would have been a nightmare for compliance reasons with my job and things like that. So, yeah, no, I uh, didn't decide to, unfortunately. But, yeah. So the the Kelly bet fraction is like for treating each um, loan individually, but are any of them contemporaneous? Because then, like. To bet that fraction on each one would assume they're all uncorrelated, but if they are correlated, you have to, I mean, or, or you could just average the bet fraction. I just want to know, like, each, yeah. no, each bet gets, each loan gets its own Kelly bet. So, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but if you have like 10 of them at once, it's like, if you apply that fraction, all of them like add it up, that would be assuming they're all Yeah, yeah, there, right? there's an additional, yeah, you can't, you, when you're doing multiple bets, there's additional formulas that you have to take into account. I have written about that previously as well, actually, uh, a long time ago. But yeah, um, typically you don't do the full Kelly bet as well. It's typically a half Kelly bet in practice, which reduces down the variance and things like that. But yeah, there's other considerations that have uh, been simplified away in this blog post, definitely, and this talk. But yeah, mm -hmm. de definitely more optimizations there. Mm -hmm. So as far as I understand, on Kaggle, um, random forests do well, and also neural networks. But there was no neural network here. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, I saw MLJ Flux is a package, though, so I could probably uh, increase it there. Um, but I, I generally tend to stay away from neural networks in this type of problem. Like I said, there's only 2,000 loans, and uh, the amount of data or the amount of predictors involved as well was very small. So I. I struggle to see if there would be that much of a benefit in neural networks, but uh, I could be proven wrong. I think one thing that would work really well and you could add to the list of models is the symbolic regression, actually, because then you can verify that the, the equation is simple enough. And you can also do that conformal um, technique to, to get the probability range. Oh yes, I've made notes, don't worry about that. Yeah. I've, uh, yeah, we'll be exploring both of them. So yeah, thanks, thanks to the other talkers. Or, all right, if there are no more questions, we can give a, <clears throat> Dean another round of applause. <laughs> thank you, thank you.